my eighth grade. This is the lecture presentation on chapters five and six from The Outsiders. Uh, go ahead and take notes while watching this video. Feel free to message me if you have any questions whatsoever as usual. Again, these are important critical notes related to chapters five and six, which I believe was task number four on The Outsiders Quest. So again, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, feel free to jump back as many times as you need to. Send me questions on Classcraft. Uh, so without further ado, let's just go ahead and jump into it. This is our presentation on chapters 5 to 6. Uh, let's go ahead and start off with a summary of the events from chapter 5 of the novel. Um, Ponyboy wakes up the next morning to find a note from Johnny saying that he's gone into town for supplies. He returns with bologna, cigarettes, and a copy of Margaret Mitchell's novel, Gone with the Wind. Um, this is an American Civil War novel that was published in 1936. It's a very popular book. Um, it had a great movie adaptation that was put out a couple years later. Um, it's got that famous line that I'm sure you've heard before. Uh, Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. To avoid capture or even identification, Johnny decides that they should cut and dye their hair. Uh, Pony Boy has a hard time accepting this. However, he's eventually going to agree, though unhappy with the decision. He knows that they do need to evade um, law enforcement at all costs because of what exactly has taken place with Bob back at the end of Chapter 4. Um, so this puts Pony in the middle of an identity crisis. Um, he's clearly troubled with the thought and eventual action of cutting and dyeing his hair. Uh, recall from our previous lectures that hair, to Pony Boy and the other greasers, is not just a part of their body, it's an imperative part of their identity. In an effort to become unidentifiable by law enforcement, Pony Boy makes himself unidentifiable to his own sense of self. So it's not just that he's masking himself, um, himself to his uh, to his peers and to, to law enforcement in this case, he's also now masking himself to himself. While reading Gone with the Wind, Johnny relates a southern gentleman from the novel to Dally. Uh, Pony states that he likes the other greasers much more than Dally. He thinks that the heroes in literature, different novels, remind him of the other greasers, but Dally, um, and I quote, is too frighteningly real. As the sun comes up on a brand new day, Pony Boy recites the poem, Nothing Gold Can Stay, by Robert Frost. Johnny connects with the poem. Um, so for the next section, I want to do a little analysis of each line of the poem. So I've got it open up here in front of me. Maybe at this point in the video, you can go ahead and do the same thing. Just open up a copy of the poem. This is Nothing Gold Can Stay, by Robert Frost. Uh, Robert Frost, famous poet, a little bit back information about him. Uh, he was born 1874, passed away 1963. Um, he has another great poem. The name escapes me right now, but it begins with uh, two roads diverged in a yellow wood. Uh, it's a, uh, the, road, the Road Not Taken. It definitely, as eighth graders, you should read that poem by Robert Frost, The Road Not Taken. Maybe I'll send you a copy um, and attach it to the links below. Um, but for right now, we're working with his poem, Nothing Gold Can Stay. So the first line uh, opens up with, Nature's first green is gold. Uh, so nature's first green can be referring to spring uh, as a season, when plants and other lush come to life after the cold winter. It is described as gold, suggesting that springtime is invaluable, meaning highly valuable. Uh, second line, her hardest hue to hold. Uh, this is a good use of alliteration. You've got that triple H, hardest hue to hold. Uh, good use of alliteration showing that the green, or in this case the gold of springtime, is the most difficult hue, and hue means color, uh, to keep. Nature is precious, and the beauty does not last very long. Line three, her early leaves a flower. Uh, line four, but only so an hour. So lines three to four, the early leaves of flowers, since in early spring, nature is full of beautiful flowers. As stated in line two, however, this beauty lasts only a short while. As a matter of fact, he shortened it down to an hour. Uh, lines five and six say, then leaf subsides to leaf, so Eden sank to grief. Subsides means to go down, to diminish. 
This serves as the transition from the golden early spring to the seasonal change. Uh, Robert Frost also uses the image of fall not only to relate to the leaves, but also to mankind's fall from the Garden of Eden, which happens to be a biblical allusion. Not only do we have a literary allusion um, having this poem uh, embedded in the book, but we also have a biblical allusion incorporated in this poem. Uh, this suggests that change can often lead to negative consequences. Of course, you know the story of the Garden, Garden of Eden. Uh, in the book of Genesis, um, Eve takes a bite out of the apple, and then from there, there leads to the fall of mankind, original sin. Um, and then we've got our final lines of the poem. Uh, so dawn goes, goes down today, nothing gold can stay. Uh, dawn is usually portrayed as rising rather than going down. Uh, the poet changes this approach to show the passing nature of dawn. The last line connects back to line one. Nothing gold can stay means that good things must eventually come to an end and that change is inevitable. Okay. Um, to go ahead and relate it back to the book, we can also relate this poem to humanity and, and, and people. And this has a lot to do with the, um, with the discussion board that you guys were doing for this week. Uh, beyond the natural, nature-related interpretation of the poem, the poem also suggestively relates to people and life in general. The main idea of the poem is that all good things must come to an end. This can be applied to holding on to youth and innocence, especially in the novel. Think of these, you know, characters who are simply just kids in the book, and yet they're growing up, and especially for Pony Boy, who seems to not really fit in in either group, um, he's got to maintain, you know, like this innocence while he progresses through life. Uh, throughout the novel, Hinton continues to use the term and idea of gold, uh, to relate to holding on to innocence and being shielded from the harsh realities of life. For those of you that have read past chapters eight, uh, 8 and maybe now looking at finishing the novel, or for those of you maybe who have already finished the novel, um, you know for sure that uh, gold um, does appear again in the book um, later on uh, that we're going to be talking about in the weeks to come. Um, so chapter 5 continuing uh, past the poem, after five days of hiding in the church, Dally arrives with a letter from Soda Pop. Uh, Dally says that the police had asked him about the murder, but that he covered them by saying that the killers went to Texas. Uh, Dally takes Johnny and Pony to the local Dairy Queen and notes that since Bob's death, the Greasers and the Sochas have been at war. Um, Johnny killing Bob and then running from uh, his actions, running away from the truth and the reality of the circumstance has escalated the disputes, has escalated the disagreement between both groups into this all-out war. Uh, the chapter closes with Dally revealing that Cherry has been a spy for the Greasers. A big fight between the two groups will be taking place very soon. And that wraps up chapter 5. Moving on now into chapter 6. Uh, at the restaurant, Johnny suggests that he wants to go home and confess to the murder. Uh, this really adds on to Johnny's character development, and I think Johnny has probably undergone the most development out of most of the characters in the book thus far. Johnny's guilty conscience is likely larger than the redemption that he achieved by taking revenge on Bob. Um, he felt that he did finally get back at Bob for beating him up, but at the same time he feels this guilt, and that guilt outweighs that redemption. Um, Dally discourages this, however. Johnny has others, not his parents, that care about him. He's got these friends of his. Uh, Dally drives the three of them, and they discover that the church is on fire. Pony thinks at that moment that he may have left a cigarette burning, which could have started the fire. At the church, the boys find school children on a picnic, and the chaperone there panics because some of the children are missing. Pony Boy and Johnny hear screaming from the church and find the missing children inside the burning building. Uh, they begin to rescue the children one at a time, and as the last one is rescued, the roof begins to cave in. Johnny pushes Pony Boy out of the window, and Pony hears a scream. When he turns to go back into the church to get Johnny, Dally knocks him out. By the time he wakes up, he's in an ambulance with one of the student chaperones that were there. That was there, Jerry Wood, minor character. Uh, Jerry tells Pony Boy that Pony caught on fire, but that his jacket saved him. Uh, Dally was burned as well, but it wasn't as serious. Johnny was hurt badly, however, as he was hit by a beam of burning timber as it fell. 
At the hospital, Pony entrusts Jerry with the truth about Bob's death, and Jerry agrees that it was self-defense. You can see this buildup of anxiety within Pony Boy as he can't hold on to this truth anymore just between him and Johnny, and he goes ahead and tells this other boy, this student chaperone, Jerry Wood, someone who he ha knows nothing about, he goes ahead and shares uh, with him, divulges exactly what had happened um, between them and, uh, and Bob that night. Uh, Soda and Derry arrive, and Derry cries. This surprises Pony Boy and makes him feel less angry at Derry because he realizes that his brother does actually care about him. He sees that Derry is so tough on him because he wants him to do so well. So this whole idea of tough love definitely makes a huge appearance at the end of Chapter 6. So let's jump now into the analysis notes, and as usual, this is very important to pay attention to, so please take notes on these um, analysis portion, on this analysis portion. Um, just to recap, um, one of the literary allusions from this selection was Robert Frost's poem, Nothing Gold Can Stay. Uh, it's the first of the two allusions that appears in this chapter. Uh, as, discussed, as discussed, the poem is symbolic to holding onto innocence and purity. Uh, Johnny connects to the poem, and it later forges an even stronger connection between him and Pony Boy. Margaret Mitchell's Gone with the Wind, as we talked about, is the second allusion literary reference in this uh, selection of reading. Uh, the allusion is used to reveal Johnny's perspective a little bit more in detail. Through the reading, Johnny connects the southern gentleman's gallant nature to the greasers, and particularly to Dally. Uh, Pony Boy begins to understand exactly the extent of Johnny's hero worship, for Dally Winston. So Johnny really, really looks up to Dally, and we can see that a lot in the way he connects Dally to the uh, to the character from Gone with the Wind. A uh, little bit more about hair that we get in these chapters. As discussed prior, when Johnny and Pony Boy cut and dye their hair, they're symbolically shedding their social identity as greasers, which creates a difficult transition to, for Pony Boy. He's never identified as anything other than a greaser, so for him to cut his hair, to change his hair, means letting go of his identity. But at the same time, cutting their hair, by cutting their hair, they're able to break free from their social categorization and connect with each other on a deeper level. So they're able to sort of now separate from greasers and connect just, just between the two of them, connect on this whole new different level that has nothing to do with being a greaser, that has nothing to do even to do with being a gang member. Um, they're able to connect much more on a deeper level on that basis. Uh, characterization a little bit on Pony Boy and Johnny. Uh, chapter 6 becomes an opposing mirror image to Chapter 4. Recall how in Chapter 4, um, Ponyboy and Johnny were runaway criminals, and now they've changed into heroes by deciding to go into the burning church to save the children. In Chapter 4, the boys could do nothing but stick to Dally's plan. Remember, they ended the chapter by going to Dally, asking Dally desperately exactly what he thought they should do. In Chapter 6, however, the boys separate from Dally's wishes by running into the church, and Dally does not want them to do that. But he go, uh, they go ahead and do their own thing. They separate themselves from Dally, uh, demonstrating their newfound independence and selflessness. Hinton proves that membership and access to the greasers does not define these boys as individuals. Uh, going back to this phrase that we've used before, the group does not define the individual. The stereotypical definition of a greaser does not always apply completely. And let's go ahead and conclude this video by going over the answers to the comprehension guide for chapters 5 and 6. Again, this was task number 4 on the Outsider's Quest. Uh, starting off with the vocabulary, number one, imploringly is an adverb defined as in an urgent and begging sort of way. Uh, the teenage girl imploringly asked her mother to let her go out to the mall. Two, sullenly, also an adverb in a grumpy manner. Uh, her mother said no, and the girl sullenly returned to her bedroom and shut the door. I tried to connect all the sentence examples here along the same storyline. Number three, eluded, verb, evaded, or escaped from, typically in a skillful, skillful or cunning way. The girl had eluded her prison and her mother's wishes, however, when she snuck out the window at night. Four, vital, adjective, absolutely necessary. To her, it was vital to go out with her friends this evening. Five, indignant, adjective, showing anger towards perceivably unfair treatment. 
Bicycling to the mall, she felt indignant at the way her mother had dismissed her wishes. 6. Jolt, verb, push or shake abruptly and roughly. Suddenly, like a jolt, morality returned to her conscious and the girl circled back home. 7. Doggedly, adverb, in a persistent and or stubborn manner. Her mother was visibly furious and doggedly punished the girl, but deep down felt positive that the girl alone had managed to determine right from wrong. So a happy ending to a little sentence example story there that we created. Uh, moving on to the comprehension questions. Number one, what is Pony Boy's issue with Johnny's suggestion that they disguise themselves? Well, Pony Boy is bothered by the idea that the disguise deals with them having to cut and dye their hair. Hair to Pony Boy, as we've talked about, is a strong part of his identity, so he feels that changing that will remove him from his sense of self. Number two, why does Johnny think that Dally is a hero? Johnny connects Dally to the southern gentleman from Gone with the Wind in terms of his gallant nature. Johnny tells Ponyboy that Dally was once arrested, but he remained cool under pressure and took the sentence, took the, uh, took the blame, even though it was Tubit who committed the crime. Number three, what poem is referenced to in these chapters and who wrote the poem? That would be Nothing Gold Can Stay by Robert Frost. Number four, why are the Sochas and the Greasers going to have a rumble? There's been a growing sense of tension between both gangs since Johnny killed Bob. The tension is so strong that Greasers cannot walk alone without fear of being attacked. Even Dally confides that he's been carrying a heater, uh, which is um, time period context for a gun. Number five, why doesn't Dally want Johnny to turn himself in, and why does Johnny insist on confessing? Dally doesn't want Johnny to turn himself in because he's been to jail before, and he knows that it can make someone bitter. Johnny is insistent because he believes he has a good chance of being let off early, as he says. He has no prior criminal record, and the crime was committed in self-defense, as also agreed by um, uh, Mr. Wood, the character from, um, from the hospital. Number six, what happens at the church? The boys notice that the church is on fire and thinks that a cigarette of his, and Pony Boy thinks that a cigarette of his may have started it. After realizing some children at a nearby picnic are missing, the boys find the children in the church and commence a rescue mission for each of them. The roof caves in as the last child is saved, and Johnny saves Pony Boy, but unfortunately, Johnny sustains a major injury from a falling piece of timber. And number seven, what does Ponyboy realize about Derry at the end of chapter six? When Ponyboy sees Derry in tears, he realizes that, and I quote, Derry did care about him, maybe as much as he cared about Soda. Moving on to the literary devices. Uh, the only question you had was find a quote from chapter 3 that foreshadows Ponyboy and Johnny's experience in the burning church. Um, that quote would be, I saw Johnny's cigarette glowing in the dark and wondered vaguely what it was like inside a burning ember. He returns to this idea, the idea of the burning ember, um, later on in chapter 6 when he says, I remembered wondering what it was like in a burning ember, and now I thought, and I thought, now I know it's a red hell. And your only key question for this um, for this comp guide was how does Hinton use humor during the church fire? Uh, she uses humor in a couple ways. Firstly, in the interactions between Pony Boy and Johnny, uh, Pony looks at him and Johnny grinned at him. It says in the book, he looked like he was having the time of his life. Uh, secondly, Hinton also uses humor with the children. When Pony Boy picks up the first kid to help him out, the child bites him. Hinton lightens the mood through her use of humor, so it's to go ahead and take away um, the tension of the situation and add a little bit of humor so it seems a little more pacifistic than it uh, typically should given the circumstances. So that concludes our review of chapters 5 and 6. Again, thank you so much for watching, and please, if you have any questions whatsoever about the chapters, about the current readings, about something you're not understanding completely, feel free to send me a message, or we'll discuss it at our next video chat next week. Um, if you feel free, please go ahead and hit that like button at the bottom of this page, and be sure to subscribe to my channel so you can keep up with all the videos as I'm posting them. Thank you so much, guys, for watching. God bless. Adios.